another close-up. Today's guest comes from Colorado, where she is the president and executive director of an organization called Wildlife 2000. Its purpose is to take the best possible care of the other living being, beings that share the planet Earth with us humans and to help us understand their needs. I'd like to introduce you to Sherry Tippy. So nice to be here. Let's start with an easy question. What brings you to Chelmsford? <laughs> Beaver. <laughs> Same type of situation that uh, we're having in Denver. Beaver are moving into the areas that they were, that they inhabited historically, and uh, people are sometimes finding conflicts with them. And is coexistence developing, or is, it, is there still work to be done there? Well, it's going to take some education, because unfortunately what happens is, is a lot of people come to management decisions without really knowing what, in fact, what type of animal they're dealing with. A lot of times when people live along our waterways, along in, or they build in floodplains, and the beaver come along and do what's natural, the first thing that comes into their mind is to get rid of it or kill it. Mm. What we like to do is to educate the people about the animals that are living around them. We believe that as our own human population overpopulates and takes over the wildlife's habitat, it's imperative that we learn about those wild creatures. So you've come to Chelmsford to tell the people of Chelmsford um, how, how to approach the <laughs> problem, huh? Hopefully enlighten them a little bit, yes. I know a man named John Beaver who lives up in New Hampshire. He says when he travels to Chelmsford, he travels anonymously because he's entering hostile territory. Oh, my. Have you encountered any hostility while you've been here? Oh, sure. Um, from some of the trappers that I think are more concerned about ho holding on to a traditional way of management a recreational activity, then they are, in fact, concerned about truly solving a problem. And do you meet with similar opposition in Denver, in Colorado? A little bit, a little bit. Not necessarily from the trappers, mm -hmm. because trapping is, in fact, illegal in Denver um, and in the metro area, which encompasses some other cities like Wheat Ridge and Aurora and Lakewood and so forth. Um, but, but sure, um, not, not, not quite as much hostility. Uh, the hostility that, that I come in contact with are from those people that, in fact, say the beaver taking down trees, there's no solution other than to get rid of the beaver. What we say is, if you take a beaver out of a habitat that is, in fact, suitable and good, which most of these drainages are, if you remove them, you leave a void that another will soon fill. Uh -huh. So, in fact, killing is not a solution. I'm sure it isn't. Some people in town suspect that in Massachusetts, the division of fisheries and wildlife's main interest lies in selling fishing licenses to fishermen and giving a free hand to have fun and maybe make a little money to the hunters and trappers. Does that apply in Colorado? It has applied in Colorado, sure, because the thing is, is usually people like me have not wanted to get involved, in fact, with the management of wildlife. The only thing that has been there for people to do is to hunt them in the traditional ways, fishing, trapping, hunting, okay? However, I'm sure like in Massachusetts, it, all, it, it says in, in our statutes in Colorado that the wildlife belong to every one of the state and its visitors. Okay, so like in Colorado, hopefully your Department of Wildlife will open up its doors and start to embrace other methods of management other than those that are traditional. No one here wants to stop hunting. All we're saying is, is let's manage our beaver or our urban wildlife in a way that's suitable for places where there's a large number of people. For instance, you cannot hunt. I'm sure in Chelmsford you'd end up shooting someone. There are plenty of places you can hunt. All we're saying is, in these areas where the people are living, let's manage the wildlife in a more humane way. People don't want their dogs to be caught in traps. They don't want their children to be caught in traps. It's inappropriate in these areas where there are so many people. 
Right. Let's talk for a minute or two about the nature of beavers. Ah. I found this quote in a children's encyclopedia. Quote, beaver, a fur-bearing animal which is the most famous, interesting, and intelligent of fur-bearing animals. Its life history reads like that of some modest, industrious race of people. What would you add to that description? Ah, oh, they're completely charming. Most beaver are very non-aggressive. A lot of them you can pick up. You know, and it's, it's interesting what you said at the end there, because there are Indian tribes in Canada that their term for beaver literally means, or their name for them, means little people. Mm. Um, both sexes, the mother and the father, engage in the child rearing. A lot of times when I have live trap males, I'll, kit, I'll get kids with them. Mm. You know, uh, I think beaver are real Jewish. They're so family oriented. Um, it's believed they're monogamous. They mate for life. Um, when George Bush was talking about family values, the beaver were practicing in them. I don't know whether you've seen on Nature PBS a program devoted uh, exclusively to beavers. Uh huh. And some of the some of the shots, of course, all shots on Nature are, are amazing showing the old father beaver mm -hmm. on patrol around his pond. Uh -huh. um, he will pursue anything that comes to infringe on his territory. And I, as you say, I, I think they're very, very close family units. Very close family units. In fact, that's why we're depending on Norplant implant or contraception to work. What we would do, like you're we're getting, doing... You're getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've heard, and maybe this is true or not, I've heard that a caged beaver uh. will stick twigs between the bars mm -hmm. and cut up a, a box or a chair to try building a dam for a stream that never flows. Have you seen that in your experience? I have live trapped over 200 beaver, had a lot of them in cages and have never seen that. Mm. Um, what I've read is that beaver will build a dam to stop the sound of the flowing water. That's what I've read. Really? I did raise a baby beaver once that would take all my shoes and pile them up in the middle of the floor. Okay, and then she'd put them back. It was the oddest thing. Um, yeah, but I've never seen that. But they do ha seem to have a need to, to build things. Mm, constru construction yeah. industry. Pile stuff up, yeah. You know, I, th I think building a, building a, <laughs> trying to build a, a dam out of your shoes is, is more That's interesting tough. than sticking twigs between I the agree. bars. And I'm sorry for getting ahead of myself. My mother said that I can turn a conversation about the price of lettuce at Safeway into beaver. So I <laughs> well, I'll, just I'll, get me going. I'll keep a close watch on you. <laughs> okay. Instead of breeding as fast as rabbits and mice, mm -hmm. beavers give birth, I believe, to only two or three kits every spring and they stay with their parents for at least the next two years, mm -hmm. learning the trade, so to speak. Mm. Now we come. <laughs> is, co is contraception a workable way of keeping their numbers under control? Okay, well, I, I need to correct you. Please? Beavers will breed according to available food. This is something else that I've read. They can have, I, I caught one beaver family that had six kids. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Sure, but um, yes, I believe that, that birth control is an answer in a lot of situations where the animals are living uh, in close proximity to humans. The idea of norplant implant is that you would relocate family members like we're doing in Denver. And I understand that a lot of Massachusetts is very heavily inhabited by humans. But then I've heard also that the western part maybe has some open areas. But you would relocate family members, leave the adult mated pair there, um, implant the female so she's unable to reproduce uh, with the nor plant that will not interrupt pair bonding. In other words, they still make love, they just don't reproduce. However, they're very, very territorial, as you stated before, mm. so they will pre prevent fertile beaver from moving in. So you have two beaver, not families of beaver. Hmm. Have, have those tests been made? Um, which uh, you mean the, as far the, as the, the normal plant? Yeah, the imp yeah. We have now implanted seven beaver, including the one at the Denver Zoo. 
uh, we implanted um, five beaver last year, and so far, no one has had kids. Where did the idea originate? Well, the idea of birth control, um, I hit upon that as I started live trapping and relocating, and I first became concerned that we were eventually going to run out of places to relocate, mm -hmm. okay, which really hasn't been the case. So far, I'm having a hard time finding beaver for everyone that wants them once people get educated as to what their role is in our environment. But I, that was my thought nonetheless. Well, as I continued to relocate, I thought, this is really similar to what kill trappers are doing. They're taking beaver out of a space that, that's great habitat, or they wouldn't be there. Yep. Others are going to move in. So kill trapping, that's only a Band-Aid approach. It doesn't really work. You just open it up a space for another one. At least my way is more humane, but that's not necessarily an answer in itself anyway. So then I hit upon the idea of birth control. And if it works on beaver, we're going to do it to humans next year. Just kidding. I always have to throw that in. Count me out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that the trappers really want to diminish the population. Um, they may fall under the same heading as the exterminator who always leaves a couple of mice mm -hmm. <laughs> to make sure he comes back to work. Right, and the or way they do it is stimulating the growth. That's right. It's exactly right. Um, beaver dams create wetlands. Yes, sir. An, envir an environment that becomes home to various species of birds and other animals. Mm -hmm. Wetlands are protected by Massachusetts law. Like in Colorado. Any comment? Just like in Colorado. And the fact that these animals are creating these wetlands, I believe that these, these areas should be protected. It's so, you know, with our new environmentally minded vice president, we got these new catchwords, biodiversity. Beaver promote, bio, my stomach's growling. Beaver promote biodiversity. <laughs> they, they, they do create wetlands. They create habitat for an abundance of other wild animals. They are incredible. They are a keystone species. The problem is, is in any time you have a problem with a wild animal, you can trace it back to humans. People are building in the wrong places. People have the audacity to build in a wetland and then wonder, or a floodplain, then wonder why it floods. They build in a wetland then wonder why they get wet. It's the humans that are the problem, truly. It's like people who build along the, the Florida coastline and then That's wonder, right. Then wonder why. Yeah, but then they build it back. Yep. Now who's the dumb animal, you know? <laughs> yeah, there are certain patterns in, yeah. all, all, in all living forms, yep. I guess. Um, in the words of an old-time hymn, mm -hmm. all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, mm -hmm. all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Mm -hmm. How many people do you think believe that today? The Lord God made them all, all creatures. Not a lot. Mm. Not a lot of folks, you know? Because the thing is, is there's a reason for everything that God created, except humans, actually. You know, I don't see what good we're doing, really, but there's really, truly a reason for everyone, everything. You realize you've just, you've just <laughs> turned Darwinian theory of evolution on its ear? <laughs> the thing is, is what beaver are doing is what God intended them to do. They're give, they can improve water quality. You can take a vial of water in a beaver pond and take a vial of water below that beaver pond and let the suspendable solids settle out, and you'll find that the water quality below there is much better than above. They can create habitat for an abundance of other wildlife. They impound water. They recharge the aquifer. They create habitat for an abundance of other wildlife. In the West, they can improve riparian habitat that's been destroyed by overgrazing or the mismanagement of our water. They can do it in a way without the destruction that the man-made dams cause. In the West, they should be worth their weight in gold. And Don't they can, say that. They, no. <laughs> you double the trapping rate. <laughs> well, no, to relocate them. Uh -huh. and, and here, the only thing that I can, you all have so many trees, perhaps you need some of them thinned out. Do you know that they can stimulate the growth of some trees? 
they promote age succession of trees, which means you have healthier stands mm -hmm. of trees. There are things that you can do for what the beaver that, for what the beaver do that's annoying. Like you can use beaver bafflers or beaver stops or limiters to prevent the water in a dam from going over a certain level. You can go out and take children out to watch these animals. The fact that they're non-aggressive make them wonderful creatures to observe. The fact that they're so, um, golly, they're so determined to build and work. You can take apart a beaver dam, the beaver will have it built up the next morning. They're incredible to watch, the way they are with their young, the way they are with each other. We have so much to learn from them. They're an exciting animal to live with and live by. And the rebuilding, repairing of dams. Yeah. I think it's true that the children will help the father, won't they? Yes, oh yes. Mm. Th that's incredible. The fathers take responsibility to rear the young, and the older siblings will care for the younger, yeah. the younger kids. I mean, it's a wonderful family relationship. Yeah, I'm beaver smitten. <laughs> <laughs> In this country, not all that long ago, beavers along with buffalo and Native Americans were killed in mm -hmm. the name of progress and pursuit of profit. Do you think hunters and trappers nowadays think they're carrying on the old Wild West tradition? You know, I think some of them have frontier hangover, and I think they need to get over it. However, a lot of hunters in my areas, when I started really live trapping beaver, and it's hard work, it is hard work, I turned to the hunters for help. The hunters were wonderful. Um, but some of them, yeah, they're stuck in the past, and that needs to change. And, and, and it'll take time. You know, they're, they're holding on to a way of traditionally managing wildlife. It's really not an answer anyway, especially for the trappers. Um, but I think you've got to be persistent. You've got to hang in there. You've got to make your Department of Wildlife answer to you, because it's your wildlife. Wildlife belong to all of us, not just to those folks that want to kill them. You know what I'm saying? Of course. So, so I think that that in Massachusetts, maybe this is relatively new. I've been doing this in Colorado since 1985, and I work very close with my Division of Wildlife. In fact, they're some of my best friends. Um, but it, it's, it's all going to happen. We just need to be persistent, and uh, we also need to start understanding each other's wildlife values. The way a hunter values animals is different than the way I value them. But I'm not saying they can't hunt. I'm saying do it with, if you're going to eat what you shoot and you're doing it with a reverence and respect that that animal is giving up its life to, to feed you, then all well and good. And okay? don't do it with a semi-automatic rifle. Right. But let's do because it humanely. That's, that's not really hunting. That's well, a true. But, but let's do it humanely and mm. let's do it with respect and reverence. But then there's some things that I want to do with wildlife, too. And the thing is, what I'm finding is, is that they love it, the fact that I'm just getting involved and getting my hands dirty. In fact, Thursday, I'm going to Pueblo, Colorado to help this hunting group improve their public or improve their public image. So we're starting to also work close with hunters. What's the name of that group? Isn't that listed somewhere? It's got a, a wonderful name. <laughs> Bell it's, Trappers and, yeah. Is that Bell's Fort Free Trappers That's and, and Muzzle That's Loaders That's it. Club? And they want me to help them improve their hunting image. And that means don't kill anything for fun. If you're going to eat it, fine. But don't kill us just because of target practice or because it's fun to kill. Because 80% of the population, the majority of us, are not opposed to hunting if you eat what you shoot. But you don't go around killing animals for fun. That's what's going to get rid of all hunting, are the slob hunters. And that's why now they're turning to people like me to help them out. Sometimes the hunters, of course, wipe each other out in the woods around here. Well, that's OK. During season. Some of us celebrate that. <laughs> So you think that hunters, trappers can be convinced that they need to get in step with the times? I think they can. I just think that they need to understand, like, I'm not a threat to them. Like I said, I'm not opposed mm. to hunting. If anybody's a threat to them, actually to hunting, it's not hunting, it's not the anti-hunters, it's the sheer numbers of people, because we're the only species that are overpopulating. That's what's going to take away hunting, just the sheer numbers of folks. I don't think you can suggest a remedy for that. Well, I've got some ideas, but I, of course, I don't want to say them publicly. No, just kidding. <laughs>
All right. Where and how can people and, wild and wildlife exist together without conflict between them? It's going to have to happen everywhere. Mm. And it's going to have to start in the schools. We literally have a responsibility to live on this planet. We have a responsibility to learn about the other living creatures around them, around us. We have to make room for everything. There's a reason that God made all the creatures. And we just seem to be as busy as cancer, wiping everything out. It's imperative that we have clean water, clean oxygen. You know what I'm saying? It, those things are imperative. It's imperative that we learn to live with our fellow creatures. We are like the environment. It's like an airplane with nuts and bolts representing the different trees, the different water, the clean air, whatever. And we're just taking away this nut and this bolt. If we keep on going, we're going to remove the wrong nut, okay? And that plane is going to crash and burn. The thing is, is we're on that plane. We can't afford to continue on the way we're going because we fit into that circle of environment. We're dependent upon everything else for our own existence. I'm sure that's true. You probably know the name of Lewis Thomas, who is a physician, a research pathologist, and an author. He sees the Earth as an enormous, self-sustaining, living cell in which all forms of life, from human beings to bacteria, are dependent on one another in some way. Remove any species, he says, and you upset the essential balance of the entire structure. I guess we both agree that's why it's important to make sure that beavers get the respect they deserve. Yes, yes. Especially, I think especially the beaver, because they are so essential to so many life forms, you know? Uh, and, and they're such a, we, ha we have so much to learn from the life around us, you know? Mm. So much to benefit from learning about no it. No question. Now, what first got you interested in the beaver? I honestly didn't know a thing about beaver I, when I first started. I knew that they had flat tails, made dams, didn't know why. Never even seen one in person. And I was just watching TV and heard that they were going to kill beavers in Aurora for taking down trees in a golf course. And uh, they said that they had no alternative. They had to kill them because there was no place to relocate them. And I thought that my job would end with finding a place to put them. And the first place I called, Rocky Mountain National Park, said, sure, bring them up, which proved to me no one had tried to find a place to put these animals, OK? And uh, when I called the Division of Wildlife and said I found a place to put them, they complained it cost too much money. And I said, what, five bucks for gas? I'd do it. So then I called the city of Aurora. And of course, they were grateful because they were getting a lot of hate calls. So I got the number of the trapper, and I said, you live trap them, I'll move them. He said, you can't live trap beaver. He said, I said, yeah, you can. I read about it in National Geographic. I guess he didn't read. And um, so I said, he said, every time he tried to live trap them, they drowned. So pretty soon I was doing everything. First night out, I caught two beaver. Since then, I've caught over 200 and relocated about 100 and 165. And uh, it's the best thing I've ever done. And I cut hair, you know, but we got to diversify. <laughs> oh, I see, we were the first doctors, too, you know. Um, but it's, it's wonderful. But I didn't mean to do it. And then the more that I learned about them and realized what an incredibly interesting animal they are and that you can pick up most of them, that's all it took. Now I go around to public schools, talk about beaver and how to coexist with our urban wildlife. Um, I've been to Reno, Nevada, helped him get started with the contraception study in Reno in the Truckee River, helped a woman get started using birth control or sterilization in Boise, Idaho, come here to Massachusetts. It's because of these animals that I've even seen my own state. I was unaware of all the wildlife that we have living around us, and we've got it all in Denver. We've got fox and deer and raccoons and skunks and all kinds of birds and beaver. It's incredible. So the beaver have only enriched my life. I could never give back to them what they've given to me. That's impressive. And you're going to continue, obviously. Always. Mm. 
Yeah, I know too much now to stop. And you, you, you must have a reputation expanding in Colorado, the beaver lady. Beaver woman, I always say ladies don't like to get their hands right. dirty. Beaver woman. Yeah. <laughs> And let's come back for a moment. The, you said that you had encountered some hostility in Chelmsford. Yes. Um, <clears throat> much on a scale, on a Richter scale, one to ten, where would you place it? Oh, ten. They got very hysterical. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, they're very emotional uh, because they feel threatened. Uh, it was kind of funny. You're not going to try to trap them, are you? Oh, I don't know where I'd put them. Who'd want them? <laughs> The thing is, is uh, one of the president of the Massachusetts Trappers Association got up and, and read a letter from this guy that's widely known in Colorado. He truly is a master killer. I bet it's a long letter. Oh, it is, it is, it yeah, is. Yeah, they always write Oh, yeah, letters. yeah. I, I mean, it's amazing. And, um, but the letter, the guy that he's quoting and he has so much respect for, um, in his trapping manual, which he sends out to trappers, mm -hmm. talks about that if you trap a raptor and you've injured its leg, that's a raptor like an eagle or a sure. hawk or an owl, just go ahead and cut its leg off. It'll learn to survive with one leg. If it's really badly injured, don't take it to a vet because the animal rights people will find out and that'll give the trappers a bad name. So just kill it and bury it. He says the same thing about dogs if they're collared or have tags, that if it's badly injured, just go ahead, kill it and bury it because that will give a bad name to trappers, mm -hmm. non-target species. So the fact that your trappers here are giving uh, credibility to a letter from this man just shows that trappers are the same all over, a lot of them, you know? Mm -hmm. What about that? <laughs> so you really think that the trappers in Chelmsford, Massachusetts can be converted from believing that trapping isn't a good idea? I think that some of them can, and mm -hmm. I tell you why. Because a lot of trappers, trapping's fun. There's no doubt about it. You, you think so? Oh, yeah. I picture it as being one of the dreariest ways of spending your time. Well, if you're trapping beaver, it. you're going to slug through wetlands. Uh -huh. There's no thrill of the chase. You set your trap, you go back in the morning and, and hope you've caught one. It's, it's like trapping lobsters. It's, it's, it's not really a sport in my view. Well, I trap. I'm a trapper. I'm a professional trapper. But you do it for a particular purpose. I do, but, there, but it's in ways that's the same. Mm -hmm. And in ways I'm hoping this will appeal to them. There's something really satisfying to get all your traps set out in specific places you've taken time, by slides, by whatever. I trapped beavers in some really interesting sets. But there's something incredibly satisfying about having those traps set. There's something exciting about going back in the morning, and I always look for movement in the water if I can't see my traps right away, to make see if I got a beaver. It's really exciting. I'm sure they feel the same way, sort of like outsmarting the animal. I have the added excitement of taking that animal from a place that's not that great, kind of dirty in the city, whatever, and putting them in a beautiful place where they're wanted and safe. And it's a hell of a lot harder to trap an animal live unharmed mm. and move it than it is to kill it. It doesn't take a lot of brains to kill anything, no. okay? But there are people that are doing trapping for recreation. But this is also a form of recreation, but it's much more of a challenge. All right, so you're, you're saying one way to, co to convert the trappers would be to add the dimension that, that yeah. you're into. So they would have the fun of it. Mm -hmm. And then the reward, and the, challenge. And, the re and the challenge, yeah. And then the reward of knowing that the animals are going to be safe, relocated. Yeah, mm. and and see, the guy that told me that he couldn't live trap beaver, he'd killed hundreds of them. I got so sick of hearing about it. He called me in 1989 and said, "Sherry, would you teach me how to live trap beaver?" I said, "Sure." He came with me. Here, he'd probably killed hundreds of beaver. Didn't know you could pick up most of them. And I have a picture of him holding a beaver kit. He has the biggest smile on his face. He told me it's one of the best things he'd ever done. I always think trapping anything, you're apt to lose digits on your hand <laughs> if, the, if the traps <laughs> catch you. These traps are big. They're, mm. they're very big. I, and they're very intense. I've had them slam on me and back some arms and stuff. I used to be bigger up here, but no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> You're going back to Colorado tomorrow? Yeah. I hope you go back with some pleasant memories of oh. Chelmsford. Oh, your Apart people from are the wonderful hostiles. here. Y'all sound like foreigners. No, just <laughs> The accent, I love the accent. Oh, I thought that was <laughs> true. That's, that's what I was thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's beautiful here. Your houses are a beautiful, beautiful place. Hmm. What about that? So thank, thank you for saying nice things about Chelmsford. Sure. You've been watching close up. Our guest today, Sherry Tippy who tells me her family comes from the north of England and that's where my ancestors came from. Thank you for watching. Watch close up next time. Now we have just a little bit. Most importantly, take care of your customer if you want to be in business another 50 years. For us, it's simple. Our people are committed and dedicated to doing the job right the first time. Customer satisfaction is a buzzword at Jaffari and Volvo Toyota. At the lunchroom, in the showroom, customer satisfaction is what you'll hear most often when you're in this dealership. People care about value. We at Jafarian care about people. Repair of today's electronic equipment has come a long way. The factory trained professionals at Bay State Electronics on Route 38 in Tewksbury will handle all of your TV, VCR, and audio equipment repair. Bay State Electronics offers a full 90 day warranty in all parts and labor, and we repair all makes and models. We've built a reputation around great service, offering free estimates on all work and a 10% discount to all senior citizens. Come into Bay State Electronics right now and have your VCR clean for just $7.95. Call us stop by Bay State Electronics for all your TV, VCR, and audio equipment repair. In these belt tightening times, your budget could probably use a breather. That's why you should tune in to Home Shopping Club for breathtaking savings on the latest looks, things that glitter, help for your home, and high-tech fun. All delivered right to your door. Home Shopping Club membership is free and automatic with your first purchase, and satisfaction is guaranteed. It's just the kind of relief your budget needs. Home Shopping Club. Great bargains. Guaranteed. Don't let your swing hibernate over the long, cold winter. Swing on over to our indoor facility, Precision Golf. Try our exciting new golf simulators with 10 world-class courses, such as Pebble Beach and Pinehurst. Precision Golf also provides driving nets, a putting green, computer swing analyzer, a pro shop, and lessons with PGA members Barry Bruce, Jim Callahan, and Bill Azzini. You can play golf for as little as $1 a hole. Call for tee times, Precision Golf, 180 Middlesex Street in North Chelmsford. Welcome to Concord, Mass., a town of two histories. Be a part of our nation's birth with the valiant Minutemen at Concord's North Bridge. Enjoy the literary history of Thoreau, Alcott, Hawthorne, and Emily Dickinson. At the heart of this history is the Colonial Inn. Originally built in 1716, the inn features elegant guest rooms and a country charm found nowhere else. Enjoy a traditional old Concord Sunday brunch with Victorian poet Emily Dickinson and the poetry of her time. 
will spread before you, tempting hot and cold entrees, imported meats and cheeses, a selection of salads, bountiful desserts,